Hey everybody, welcome to another video, and um, yeah, just so you know, I'm wearing this dumb shirt again, and I, it's a laundry day, what can I tell you? really is laundry day, so I'm just wearing this shirt again, but in case you watch these videos and you wonder, does he ever change his clothes? I do. None of your business anyway if I don't, but I do. So, all right, listen, welcome to another video. Here is what I want to talk about today, and... I've mentioned before the name James Kugel, who was my doctoral advisor, a Jewish scholar, uh, now living in Israel, and we just recorded a podcast with him recently, which will be probably out early in the fall. Very excited about that. But one of his areas is, and I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to go in a different direction with it. One of his areas is how Jewish interpretation, how it began. And, you know, he... he talks a good bit about that, but basically we're talking a couple hundred years before Christ. It's a bit earlier than that, too, but, you know, in, in, a, in a real serious way, maybe a couple hundred years or so before Christ is when it actually began. And that's the topic that <clears throat> really turned things ar around and then upside down. Actually, it turned it upside down first, right, the deconstruction stuff, and then turned it around for me because I began to see connections with the New Testament, which is also a Jewish text. And there's a lot of biblical interpretation going on there, right? So anyway, here, here's what I want to focus in on, though. Uh, Kugel, you know, in his you know, decades of work in this, said, you know, ancient interpreters, they made certain assumptions about the Bible, what we might call a doctrine of Scripture, you know, in evangelicalism. But uh, they made certain assumptions about the nature of the Bible, four specifically. And I want to tell you what they are and then sort of comment a little bit on why I think this is a really interesting thing to keep in mind for us as we read our Bible. Um, first, the Bible is cryptic. Its real meaning is not what it says on the surface, it's below the surface. And an example, I want to tie the New Testament into this pretty quickly. Um, an example of that is like, you know, all these places in the Old Testament that talk about David and, you know, the New Testament writers like, well, it's not about David, it's actually about Christ, it's about Jesus, right? See, the real meaning is not the surface meaning, there's a hidden meaning beneath, <clears throat> and you need to have some way to access that meaning. And that's a real important element, I'm going to come back to that later, this is a very important element to the nature of the Bible and Judaism, it's cryptic, its meaning is not on the surface. Its meaning is not the plain meaning, in other words. Uh, another assumption is that there are no contradictions, you know, since, uh, you know, this is scripture. Uh, any contradiction really is more of an apparent contradiction that forces you to look deeper. Actually, it's, a, it's an invitation to read that Bible cryptically, <clears throat> right? Contradictions and weird stuff like that, that's just an invitation. So, listen, you have to look more deeply here. You can't just sort of take the contradictions and run with them, okay? Uh, a third assumption is that the Bible is relevant for us, which is sort of tough because the Bible is about this bygone time. But they say, listen, if this is, you know, the Word of God, which is our language, by the way, they, they didn't really say that about the Bible, but that's what they meant. You know, the Bible is a Word of God. It's relevant for us. It's not about the past. It's about the present. And guess what you need to do? In order to bring this Bible into your present, you have to get sort of creative about the Bible and look for that cryptic hidden meaning. See, it's the cryptic part that holds it all together, right? And, you know, examples of that abound, but, uh, you know, and this even happens in, in just regular, like, Christians reading the Bible. We'll read a psalm, and our first thought usually isn't, you know, <clears throat> what's the historical circumstance of this? You just assume it's relevant for us. What can I learn about my life and my problems and my challenges or my joys from reading the psalm? So it's immediately relevant to you. Uh, the last one is that it's divinely inspired. And um, Kugel says that this is not actually the foundation for all the others. It's more like a conclusion after the fact. But they did think this book is a gift from God. And therefore, it's to be read cryptically. There are no contradictions. And it's relevant for us. Modern biblical scholarship, and this is going somewhere, folks, trust me. Uh, modern biblical scholarship uh, does not share any of these assumptions. The Bible's not cryptic. It's actually 
it says what it says, and our job is to dig into history to find it out. The real meaning of the Bible isn't the cryptic hidden meaning, it's the, let's say, historical contextual meaning, right? And by the way, as I look at modern scholarship, feel free to say, Pete, that's pretty much what you say, and it is, right? Um, get to that too in a second. Uh, but the Bible has no contradictions, right? Well, yeah, it does. You know, it has contradictions because, and if you've read my stuff, you know where this is going. The Bible is written at different times in different places um, for different circumstances, different reasons, and so you're going to see some contradictions, right? That, that's a modern approach. Uh, also, the Bible is relevant for us. Well, you can make it relevant for you, but it's actually not written with you in mind. It's not written for you to sort of take lessons from it. That's how the Bible came to be used, but that's not a property of the Bible itself. In fact, if you're going to be really get back to the Bible as it was, you're going to get over this notion that it's written for you. It's not. It's actually not really terribly relevant for you unless you make it relevant and divinely inspired. And I said, well, you know, there's really nothing in the text that would suggest that given all the other stuff we see. And um, you can believe that if you want to, but it's not an inherent part of the Bible. So you have here, here's the point, you've got ancient assumptions and you have modern assumptions that sort of butt heads. And <clears throat> part of my own sort of process, spiritually, theologically, intellectually, is how those two worlds can be in conversation with each other, or if that's possible. I think it is, and how, we'll just read all my stuff. Um, Kugel is very much about that question too. He has different answers. He says, you sort of almost have to look at the Bible, choose which one you want to emphasize and go with that, right? I'd like to see there's a little bit of more interplay between modern views, which have been very helpful, but also an ancient view which is also very important because, as Kugel says, it's these ancient assumptions about the Bible, hear this, that actually created the Bible as we know it and allowed it to continue in its importance. We owe an awful lot to these Jewish beginnings of biblical interpretation because if it weren't for these four assumptions, the Bible would have stayed a relic of the past. Okay. Again, if you've read my stuff and even watched some of these videos so far, like, okay, I sort of get that. You, you've said this before. But here's the thing that Kugel picks up on that really escaped me. And this is really more relevant for, let's say, conservative evangelicalism or, you know, fundamentalism. He says those four assumptions, they, you know, conservative interpreters, conservative Christian Protestant interpreters specifically, they actually accept three of those four assumptions. And which one don't they accept? See, this is interesting. The Bible is cryptic. The Bible has no contradictions. The Bible is relevant for us, and the Bible is divinely inspired. Of those four, I think you can probably guess, well, they do believe it's divinely inspired and therefore like inerrant, right? There are no contradictions. So there's two of them right there. And it's relevant for us. It's meant for us to sort of learn, you know, what lessons are we going to learn from Scripture? The one that they lose is cryptic. The Bible's not cryptic. The Bible's meaning is plain. And here is the tension between ancient interpreters and certain modern conservative Protestant interpreters, that the ancient ones understood that in order to see no contradictions, in order to see the Bible's relevant, in order to see it's divinely inspired, you have to go for a cryptic, deeper meaning than what's on the surface. Fundamentalism basically says, no, on the surface, there are no contradictions. You don't have to go into some cryptic level. On the surface, it's relevant for us. On the surface, we see how divinely inspired it is. And that causes a lot of tensions because what fundamentalists do, and here's the point, folks. I, 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 hope, I hope this is going to be clear because I think it's so very, very important, all right? Fundamentalists defend how they read the Bible by essentially modern terms, right? The Bible is not cryptic. No, it's plain sense, right? That's one of the modern assumptions. And that drives, the idea of crypticness drives both ancient interpreters, but modern interpreters as well. Ancient interpreters because they accept it, modern interpreters because they don't accept it, they reject it, but yet they want all the other assumptions to work. And Kugel says they don't. I think that's a brilliant insight, and which is why you've got such tensions between 
you know, conservative fundamentalist interpreters and the modern world that we live in. This is why, see, this is why you have apologetics. I just thought of a good title for the whole video. I'm going to say why we have apologetics. It all comes down to assumptions we make about the Bible. Um, you have apologetics because you have to defend the non-contradictory, let's say, inerrant nature of the Bible. You have to defend its divine inspiredness. You have to defend that it gives you lessons for today, whether it's about human sexuality or science or whatever. You have to defend that on the basis of a plain reading of the text, which is a very modern assumption, not an ancient assumption. And so there's a sort of a schizophrenic element in conservative Protestant interpretation. And I think to me, that's a brilliant insight. Now, what we do, like people like me and maybe like us who are, I hate to use the word progressive, but you know what I mean, right? Um, what do we do about these assumptions, given that our own New Testament shares these four assumptions? But we're still living in the modern world. How do you navigate those two worlds? Well, uh, welcome to the fun, I think. You know, to me, this is a very interesting thing to do. Um, the world does not hang in the balance and how we sort of reconcile these ways of talking or bring them into conversation. I just think it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and it's an honor to be able to think through that stuff. But I know we have to. See, I know we have to do that. And I think the modern fundamentalist way of reading is pretty much dead in the water because they want their cake and they eat it too. Right, so um, Google puts it this way, they want their Bible and their modern interpretations too. You can't have both. You can't defend all that ancient stuff on the basis of the modern assumption that nothing is cryptic, okay? I just, to me, that's like, oh, so much, things fall into place, you know, little wheels and things that just clunk into place when I hear stuff like that. Anyway, all right, folks, that's this week's video. Thank you for watching and um, see you soon. Appreciate you being here and thanks for watch, uh, watching this and pressing play. See ya.